everyone and welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Venicia. This is the Woolly Worker Knitting Podcast and today I am joining you for episode 27 of the Woolly Worker Knitting Podcast. It's good to be filming today. It is Saturday. There's a rare moment of sunshine outside which is why I'm really excited to be filming and showing you all my finished items and whips in the light that they deserve and hopefully it will stay sunny this afternoon so I can go take some finished item photos. Um, like I said, there's three finished items, two whips that I want to talk about, a few swatches and plans for the future and what you can expect from me, a couple of updates and just a bit of live chat at the end. I think that's going to be pretty much it. I don't think there's anything else to say in this intro. Um, as always, if you want to find me on social media, you can find me on Ravelry, Instagram, Coffee at The Woolly Worker. You can support me for the price of a cup of coffee or buy me a pattern for my Ravelry wishlist. The links will all be down below. And if you want, you can also join the Discord for The Woolly Worker. It's really social and we share progress on our projects, just talk about yarn and it's been really nice to chat to you guys over there. Thank you for the love that you put for my latest knit and chat, especially surrounding the discussion regarding stash and consumerism and, and ads and podcasts. It was really insightful to read all of your opinions, whether you um, were on like the same side of the issue of me or not. Like I feel like you really opened my eyes to a lot of different perspectives and it was really eye-opening to read a lot of the comments. So thank you so much if you took the time to leave one. I'm still working my way through them, but it was really, really nice to, to get that positive response to something that can be a bit controversial, I guess. But yeah, it's been really enjoyable. Um, I've been having a lot of fun with my knitting and I can't wait to share that with you today. So let's just go straight into it. Like I said, I'll talk about what I'm wearing first, which is a finished item, then we'll go into the rest of the finished item. So this is the Urania Cardigan by Sari Nordland. This is from her book Softly Timeless Knit that came out. I know it was before Christmas because I received a book for Christmas. Um, <clears throat> that was excellent timing on her part for sure. I finished a pair of socks last episode from that book as well, the Telxino socks. This is the Urania. All the patterns are named after muses from Greek mythology, which is a really nice touch. And um, I've talked about this cardigan in a, in a few episodes, so I'll try not to repeat myself. And I'll also be showing photos on screen and videos of me trying it on and, and showing it off in its glory. It's coming out a little maybe dull right here, but it is quite blue in person and I really think that we're going to be able to capture that in natural light outside. So this is made with Knitting for Olive Merino in blue tit and Camaro's Midnight Soul in Midnight Blue. I talked about the yarn combination before, I really enjoyed Midnight Soul as a substitute for mohair. There's no itch factor whatsoever and you can take my word for it, I am very sensitive to mohair. Obviously still make your own decisions based on what you know about your body and that it might differ but I, I really can say without any lie that this is next to skin soft. I'm wearing like a t-shirt here and it just feels really soft without feeling prickly. I will say my only negative point about this substitute is that the fibers seem to be quite a bit longer than mohair and what this does is that uh, you lose a lot of the stitch definition and it, it looks really fuzzy and blurry and yeah I feel like I don't mind it obviously but um, this affected the, the way that the cable shows in this cardigan and maybe something to keep in mind if you were wanting to do something like lace or cables it wouldn't show as much same as the ribbing the ribbing is looking quite flat um, and not defined so it was a surprise and I guess I have this information now and I can make decisions later on. Um, I do think it's it's totally worth it and I'm not going back to mohair. There's a big color selection for Midnight Soul from Kema Rose. I definitely have my eye on a few projects, for example like for, from Petite Knit that use mohair I want to use Midnight Soul for. They have a white, they have a beige, they have a grey, so yeah, I'm, I'm super duper happy with this uh, yarn combination. The Merino bloomed as well, a lot with blocking and relaxed, so um, it is quite a light fingering but then it, it does kind of open up a little bit with water and I think it drapes really beautifully, the, the whole garment just hangs really nicely on my body. Something that I was worried about at first was that the rib was really cinched in at the start, like at the, um, the hem ribbing, 
but then that relaxed with blocking and now it just like falls as opposed to cinches in which is what I wanted and um, the cable relaxed as well the way that the cardigan is constructed is I, I thought it was a drop shoulder at first but it's not it's kind of like a Mm, I actually don't know and I should have looked that up. I don't know what it's called, but you start at the back neck and then you basically do quite a fair amount of increases really rapidly. And what this does is that this creates this line here because you're doing all of your increases sort of next to a raglan stitch. So it's kind of like a raglan stitch detail and I'll show you close ups later. And uh, after you reach the right amount of stitches, you then separate for uh, front and another front and the back and then you work on these with the cable detail at the same time and I think I really enjoy that construction because what this does is that it separates the cardigan into three distinct sections for a lot of the process which makes it less um, boring than when you're doing a big raglan cardigan and you just have so many stitches to go back and forth for a long period of time I, f I feel like this cardigan never became a chore it is quite cropped as well and there's some body decreases so even once you join everything back um, like the front and the backs when you join them to work the body it still doesn't feel like too much or too many stitches for, for too long uh, the cable I still need a cable needle for but you don't cable too frequently so I didn't find that that was impeding my groove and my rhythm in fact it just made it a bit more addictive because you always just wanted to reach the next cable um, so I really like the process of this cardigan. It was a really enjoyable process knit and I absolutely adore the final piece. I was saying earlier, it's just like the perfect, comfy, slouchy, relaxed fit. I just love that there's a, a, a lot of ease over here, but yet it doesn't create too much fabric. I can just throw it on top of everything. I'm super pleased with my choice not to add any buttons because it just feels like something that you can wrap yourself in and it doesn't feel like it needs the buttons. And then I also wore it to date night the other day, so it was like elevating the outfit and making me feel cute in my hand knit, something that I was proud to wear in public, something that still felt like, you know, good enough to be worn out. Um, but, but yeah, I can totally see myself just shoving this on the back of my chair and having it on hand to layer for the rest of the cold season here. Um, the modification that I did obviously then is that I didn't add the button band. Sari normally has you do a folded over stockinette button band and has like snap buttons. I saw a modification from Tori on Instagram where she just did an I cord so I, I really liked that and I was really inspired so I did this. There were three things that I thought were going to come into play there. There's the pickup ratio of stitches along there should they be the same as the stockinette button band if I was to do an eye cord? Then secondly, should I be doing it on the same needle size as recommended for the stockinette if I'm doing an eye cord? And then thirdly, would I be doing a three stitch eye cord or a four stitch eye cord? I could have played around with swatches and tried different things. I just kind of went with my gut and I'm quite happy it worked out. Uh, I picked up the same at the same ratio that Sari calls for. She doesn't give you a stitch count, she just tells you a ratio because it'll obviously depend on um, how long you make your cardigan. So I, I did the ratio that she calls for, then I used the same needle as I used for my ribbing, which was 3.5 millimeters, and then I did a four stitch I cord because I thought I didn't want it to completely disappear and fold it on itself. I wanted people to be able to notice that there was a finishing and at first I was worried it was a little too bulky and too large. You'll see in the photos. Let me know what you think. I think it turned out okay after I finished the entire thing. Maybe at the beginning because that was all I could see. It looked off balance because it was too many stitches, a four stitch eye cord. But after I finished the whole length, I thought that it doesn't look too out of place. In retrospect, I could have been fine just doing a three stitch eye cord. So yeah, I hope that those findings are helpful for you if you were wanting to make the same modification or if you wanted to make that modification on other cardigans. I really like the look of the eye cord next to the cable. I think it just looks exact exactly like the stockinette um, on the other side of it. I like that the cables are mirroring each other. For the bind off, Sari just says to bind off in pattern because you've got your rib to bind off and then you've got your cable to bind off. But I really wanted to keep my sewn bind off look for all my ribbing. So what I did was that I started binding off in knits 
at the start. So like, you know, you just knit two and pass the stitch over, knit one, pass the stitch over. I just did that for like the length of the cable, which was like, let's just say 10 stitches. Then for the, then I, then I transitioned to doing a sewn bind off. And before blocking that little transition was a little gappy and loose. But after blocking, I cannot tell there's a difference between um, the tension of the bind off on the cable and the bind off afterwards. So I'm really happy that I tried this technique so that way I could get the bo best of both worlds and get my, um, you know, neat. I don't want to say tubular because it's not tubular. I didn't do set up, set up rows. So it was a sewn bind off and I really like that look and I didn't have to compromise. Same on the other side. I think it looks really good. It's a really nice neat finishing that matches my uh, sewn bind off on those sleeves. I also cropped the cardigan a little bit. I initially was going to crop it significantly more. I wanted this to be worn over dresses, um, but I chickened out, I guess, at the last minute, or I, I lost track and I was doing my body decreases. And when I finished my last body decrease, I wasn't actually that far off from the length that was specified in the pattern. So I cropped three centimeters or four. It'll be on my Ravelry notes. And in the end, it's actually not that cropped. I think it's it's actually the perfect length where it doesn't, it's just, you'll see in the photos, I think it, it is the perfect length and I'm really happy with it. I still don't have a cropped cardigan for dresses, so that'll be something that I want to make for myself in the future. It's still a gap in the wardrobe. I don't have that many knitted cardigans, so I'm happy that this one is a length that I can wear with more things than just dresses, so I didn't close that door for myself. But um, yeah, I think this would still work well with dresses though. It's just not as cropped as I had envisioned. I just never have the guts to, to really go for it and chop it. Um, I also, to crop it, made the decreases a little faster than Sari called for, even though I was on gauge for row gauge, um, because again, I didn't want to to make it too long accidentally. So I think I, I, I removed one or two rounds between each decrease. Um, so overall, I'm super pleased with this card again. I'm really happy that I used a pattern from a book that I received. I did it in a color that is quite fun, different than the usual neutrals uh, and is still very wearable for me. Blue is kind of my neutral, I guess, like a navy is really nice and still fun over dresses, I think, in a fiber that I know I can wear and I'm not going to let that one sit in the wardrobe for the whole year because I find it too itchy or too warm. Like the fact that I wore this on the date outside um, really speaks volumes as to how wearable this piece is going to be for me. And um, in terms of costs, I received the yarn as a Christmas gift from, from family, but I still calculated what this would have cost me and it was £54.12 pences. Oh, I never say it that way. 54.12. Um, it used, let me check. Just under five balls of Midnight Soul and just over four balls of Knitting for Olive Merino. So yeah, if you cropped it a little bit, maybe you could only buy four balls of Merino. Uh, and that would be a bit, yeah, that'd be economical. It's still obviously a bit pricey because you're holding two strands together, but I, I think it was worth it. I could totally see myself making another one of these, maybe in a lighter color, just to make it different. I would still do that same I-cord modification because I really love this so much. And maybe I would make it with a lace alpaca or just a simple DK yarn to then get that cable to be more defined and also having something that isn't as fluffy. So yeah, I, I feel like I could see myself in, in a creamy one or like a blush pink or baby pink that could be super super cute with white dresses so overall super happy with this card again it was a huge success and uh, i hope that maybe you can learn a thing or two from my experiences knitting this because it's not something that has a huge amount of projects on instagram or ravelry so i'm happy to have pioneered this um knit okay so the next category will be my finished items. The first one I will show you is the Louder Vest Test Knit that I did for Rebecca from Le Crea Bea. The pattern is coming out on Friday. I think that's the, is it the 20th maybe? 
no, 22nd of March. So pattern is coming out really soon. So here's my version. Uh, I forgot to mention last time, but this is made in Filkulana Peruvian Highland Wool in the color Limpopo. I really like that color when I used it on my Levi pullover as a contrast color, so I grabbed a, a, a vest quantity. It's a really great yarn for cables and textures. It also has subtle marling um, within it. It's a really nice um, brown slash gray. It has a tiny little bit of blue specks in it and it's not too distracting from the cables. I think the cables are still very 3D even after block. I like my uh, rib detail. I like that this is quite a cropped vest. Um, at first it was very cinched in and had negative ease, but it really blocked and opened out, which is great because um, while I liked the way it looked on me, it was still wearable when it was negative ease. Um, I think it'll be a bit more wearable and comfortable if it r relaxes, which it did. As you can see, there's some really nice details uh, of the cables running at the front. I showed this last time as well. And obviously at the back, you may have seen this on Rebecca's podcast, there's that nice cable going uh, at the shoulder. And I really like the construction of this. I've talked a lot about this pattern while I was making it um, and the steps that it took. So the construction of the back yoke with the increases, the V-neck depth. So if you're interested in this and you're new to the channel, I really would recommend checking out the past podcast because last time I think I had already done all the ribbing trimmings and I was just working my way down the body. So I'll show some photos on the screen uh, when we take them to, to, to show what it looks like on me. I don't know if I'm going to be wearing this over dresses or if it's a bit too long, but definitely over a t-shirt or some dress shirts will be really lovely. Um, I mirrored the cables, which was a modification I really wanted to do. Thank you, Rebecca, for letting me um, experiment with that. And I'm, I'm really pleased with how that looks on the V-neck twists. I don't think it's that noticeable in the other uh, columns of cables. I think the most important place that this is uh, noticeable is at the V-neck. Um, I put notes on my Ravelry on how to do that. I also did my twisted rib, as you can see, which I think works really well with the center double decrease at the V-neck. I'm happy with my color choice. I didn't want to make just a cream cable knit. I tried to, to, to think ahead and I know I'll be making a lot of cable knits in the future. I don't want them all to look the same. So I went for that medium tone, which in the end resembles a bit my Lana vest, but I think this gray brown looks better on me, or I prefer anyway, than the brown brown that my Lana vest was. Um, and even though they're both cabled vests, this one is definitely less slouchy. It comes less at the, um, like it drops less. It's less loose, there's less ease, and it's shorter. So they're definitely two different vests, even though at first I was worried I was just knitting the same thing over and over. It was a little time consuming towards the end, and I can't even imagine what the sweater would be when you still have to make the cabled sleeves afterwards. So I did find it a bit tedious at the end. There's a lot of cables, they happened relatively frequently, and even though the pattern was memorizable and easy to just do without looking and with, well, without looking at a pattern, and without a cable needle, I, I still found myself a bit um, sogged down by it and I just told myself, do <clears throat> one cable repeat a day, which then turned to turned out you know, to, to, to be two or three pattern repeats a day, like you just get into a groove and it, it happens faster than you would think. Um, the total cost for this one with Phil Klan at Peruvian Highland Wool was £20.88, so really good, really affordable for for a vest, obviously if it was a sweater it would be more. The pattern comes as a mega pattern with three different versions. You've got cardigan, sweater and vest. Um, a lot of you said in my latest episode that you were definitely going to get the pattern, so it'll be nice to see more and more of these pop up on Ravelry and Instagram when the time comes. And again, as a thank you for test knitting her pattern, Rebecca is going to offer all of us a free pattern of our choice for her store, but I've already got all of the patterns from her that I want. So once again, I'd like to thank one of you guys for watching the podcast and I will then pass on that free pattern to you. And the details on how to do that will be at the end of the episode. There'll be a little game for you to, to take part in if you wanted to maybe get that pattern or any other pattern of your choice. So stay tuned for the end of the video for that. But I think that's it for the louder vest. I am excited to have it. Um, 
it, it was really nice to be doing another cable knit and a vest was lesser of a commitment than a sweater. I've not worn that one out yet. I'm excited to take the photos to today. And I think it's the perfect time to have a vest is now, March and April. It'll be very good to keep my core warm and just a little piece to, to layer. So I think, yeah, if you're wondering if vests are for you, then maybe this would be a good one to, to dip your toes into the, the world of vests and slipovers. Next finished item, I am hugely excited to show you. This was something that I, I, I wanted to have for this episode, but wasn't sure I would. But um, yeah, it is my Nelly Fair Isle cowl by Mari Wallen. Um, I said last time that I hadn't touched it since the previous episode, so a month ago. I was just quite demotivated because uh, it has two full pattern repeats. I had done one, and so I just kind of lost motivation because you lose that <clears throat> novelty element and it's just not a surprise anymore what, what next motif is going to be on your um, needle. And yeah, I was just kind of bored of it. But then a lot of you guys motivated me to pick it back up. I have another Fair Isle cowl that I need to do for a test knit. So I really didn't want to have both at the same time. That was a really good motivation. That was a really good motivation then to keep that one going. And in the end, crazily, I, I was off this week so uh, or last week. So I was able to do that whole pattern repeat in three or four days blocked it, um, it blocked really fast, it dried really fast even though usually my knits don't so this is a testament to the yarn and then I grafted it yesterday and, and voila we have it so this is the Nelly Fair Isle Cowl by Mary Wallen um, it is made with Jemisons of Shetland Spin Rift for ply as you can see it's just a big tube grafted uh, seamlessly I'll show you a close-up of the graft and you can Tell me if you notice where it is. I'll give you a big close up here and then I'll I'll tell you where it was. Did you did you see it? I hope you didn't. So uh, I showed last time, but I did a modification to this because the original pattern has you repeat the motif, I think three times, but I thought that that would be way too slouchy and I wouldn't like how deep that would come down on my neck. Um, but if I only did the pattern two times, it would be way too close to my neck and not as comfortable, especially because this is quite a rustic wool. So I was in a bit of a conundrum. Two is too little, three is too much. What do I do? I decided to add a couple of motif repetitions. So in the end, that green band, I repeated once more, uh, even though the pattern only says to do it once per pattern repeat. And then I actually added a pattern repeat from the Burra cowl, which is my other Mari Wallen cowl. And it's that one with the little blue diamonds that wasn't in the pattern. And I'm really happy with the way that this looks. At first, I thought I was worried that it was going to through the whole color scheme of balance i'll show you what the pattern repeat is so you start so you start you start off with this green motif at the bottom then you have this huge star motif and a few little bands that motif here and then you've got the little uh, yellow zigzag or orange zigzag and then that's when it ends so what i added was that green thing and those blue things um and at first when I just did my one pattern repeat, I was worried that it was looking a bit too blue and maybe unbalanced and I was doubting that addition basically. But once I started working the second repeat, I thought that everything evened out nicely and I feel like when you're looking at this, it doesn't really stand out or... Yeah, uh, so maybe it was because I was looking too close to it. Basically what I'm trying to say is I, I took a risk and I added something which I was worried was going to throw off the balance of the colors and the shapes, but it worked out. So yay for that. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy. The whole color palette of this is really muted. Um, the yarn bloomed beautifully in block as expected. This is something that I always look forward to when working with Jameson's of Shetland wool is that it transforms completely. The stitches are so even. They look perfect, they're so symmetrical, there's no tension issue whatsoever. Although saying that, because it is a long tube, which at first was a long scarf, like an ungrafted tube, I blocked it and I tried to block it so that the width would stay the same, 8 inches, all the way throughout. But 
despite my best efforts, I could see that sometimes it wasn't quite 8 inches, it was maybe like 7.5. So it wasn't a straight line like I would have wanted or like what would normally happen if your tension was the same all the way throughout. Um, but that's fine. When you're folding it like this in your cowl, you can't really see that some of the edges are bigger than other, like it doesn't look wonky, I don't think. So yeah, I think this is a really good piece of, knit piece of knitwear. Uh, I'm entering this in a yarn show, so I really hope that the judges like it. Um, I'll tell you updates on that when it comes, but it's not for a while. Um, so this, uh, this was 25.5 inches before block, and I wanted 26 inches. So at first I thought, yay, uh, my calculations were right, I was right to add those little extras and I'm almost at the length that I wanted. But then in the end with blocking it went to 28.5 inches, so it added 3 inches in block, which is quite a lot for a yarn that usually doesn't stretch that much like merino wood. Usually the Shetland wool has a tendency to kind of bloom and expand in, in volume, but not so much in length. So maybe it was because I really stretched it out on purpose, um, or maybe it's just because it was quite a long tube, so every little bit matters, and overall those little increments of blocking really add up over the length of the entire um, scarf. Um, I held the contrast color dominant in all of my motifs, just to stay consistent, so uh, for example here the orange was dominant, the blue here was dominant, um, just to make sure that the motif really stands out. And I think it, it looks like a really nice even printed fabric. Um, the beginning of round is hidden in the fold, so if I unfold this I can show you what it looks like. Obviously because it was blocked it has a bit of a fold there, but I think for a beginning of round, it's really not bad. It doesn't look too jarring um, and any inconsistency anyway will be hidden by by it being folded when it's worn. So obviously it's in the middle there. I don't know if you can see any weird issues. Um, there's not that much of a jog and I use the spit splicing method for most of my ends and sometimes if the color was repeated not too long later, I'd carry the yarn up and I really didn't have that many ends. Like, it was annoying to do all that yarn management throughout, but what a relief it was to fold the tube inside out and realize that you only had, you know, maybe a dozen ends to weave in, or maybe a couple dozens, but it could have been so much worse with that many color changes. So I'm really looking forward to taking that technique with me when I make my future color work projects, especially the yellow cardigan, which I will talk about at the end of the episode. Um, really happy with my kitchenering technique then for the graft at the end. I hope that photos will have been on screen of me wearing this again in the natural light. I think it will really shine. And I'm as pleased with it as I was expecting going into this project. And I'm really proud that I finished it in, I guess, just under a month uh, with a huge uh, break in the middle. The This ended up taking the equivalent of four balls of yarn, so 100 grams, even though it used maybe 12 different colors. Um, I put the yarn amounts that I used on my Ravelry for each color. Again, bear in mind that I uh, added a couple of motif repetitions and only did two overall instead of three. Um, and so the total cost for this, the equivalent, is £14.24, so not pricey, but again, bear in mind that every ball is at least £3.50, so unless you already have the colours, you have to invest in getting all of the little colours, or you could go stash diving, obviously. Um, at this point, I have quite a big selection of Jameson's colours, and I'm able to to pick colors I already have in stash, which is very satisfying and really motivating me to make more Fair Isle patterns because I have that little yarn library of of Jameson's colors. Um, so yeah, maybe now is a good time for you to start your collection and start getting some of the basic colors like, you know, a blue, a yellow, a red, an orange, uh, a beige, a gray, and, and they will come in handy in, in basically all of Marie Wallen's patterns. I would say that this and the Bura Cowl are just really good basic colors to have. So I would really highly recommend you, like t buying this palette um, or the Burak Owl palette to start your Fair Isle adventure, I would say. 
or just pick a pattern that you like and get the colors from, from that pattern, obviously. And then a quick little update on my winter clutch. I showed it last time. Um, I, I was saying that I wasn't sure how long it was going to be until the next update because I ordered some finishings from a shop in China and they arrived earlier than I thought. So I didn't want to buy the Petite Knit kit. I wanted to see if I could source my own materials for the finishing for the winter clutch. And uh, I'm pleased to say that I'm, I'm really happy with the, um, the materials I've received. So I'll show you what my clutch looks like now. So as you can see, I put the, the frame in and it really changes the whole look of this. Like this actually looks like a bag now. Um, it's still not lined. So I'll show you what it looks like when you open it. There we go. So that's the inside right now. The frame I used, uh, I'm, I'm really pleased with it. It's obviously the right size, which I was the most worried about. Um, Petite Knit says what the size frame she uses in her description, so it wasn't like that information was hard to find. Um, I, I think it was 19 centimeters. And then I, I sewed it in and that was really easy. There was a video from Kimi on YouTube that was just perfect, super well explained and demonstrated. It was a piece of cake, even though it was something that I hadn't done before. If you've ever done a folded hem, it's the same thing, but with a, a frame in the middle, like that you just have to hold on a little bit at first. But um, once you sew in a few of cent the centimeters, it just holds itself in place relatively easy. The only bit I was worried about was um, going to be this part of it. So I got two frames because I knew I was going to make another petite knit clutch at some point. So um, yeah, I've got this frame here. Um, this is the bit that I was worried about because it's obviously bulkier and thicker than here. And I didn't know if my folded edge would cover this well enough and whether it was going to snag on the little edges. And I'll show you on the frame when it's like closed, you can sadly see um, don't know if you can see it kind of poking out. It is sharp-ish, uh, so it, it does kind of want to leave that enclosing. And when it's open, um, I don't know, you can see again a bit of the frame poking through that green. It's not ideal, but it hasn't broken. I mean, I've not used this yet, so maybe that's not a good sign. But once I put the lining in, and the um, chain and I wear this out and use it as a bag, we will see if the usage and, and friction and everything, if that makes my yarn split or break. I hope it doesn't. I don't know if the petite knit frame is thinner at this edge and or, or whether the problem also occurs with hers. It's not that big a deal. I'm, I'm honestly just really, really pleased that it all worked out with, with that frame. So I will put the link of the Etsy shop in the description if you wanted to get that uh, frame for your clutches. Um, and I also got a chain from the shop. So here it is. It is an, in the color burnished bronze, I think. And I'm super pleased with it. It looks like a really nice um, bronze color. It looks, it doesn't look cheap. And I think it also, I was worried it was going to be like plastic and feel cheap, but it's quite heavy and, and weighty. Like it feels substantial in my hand. In fact, it's, it's quite a lot heavier than the clutch itself. I'm still missing some rings that I need to source somewhere else before I can attach this to this and then also the lining. So I'll give a last update on this clutch when I do these last parts, but I wanted to just let you know that I was pleased with how that step went and that I so far can recommend this if you don't mind the little edges poking through a little bit. And if anybody has the petite knit one, can you tell me if you're also experiencing that part showing through or if it's not a problem? Because then that would be a good motivator to actually get the petite knit one. So I think that's everything for finished items. I hope that I wasn't too rambly. I hope I, I got across what I wanted to say, but I've been really, really enjoying finishing those projects, getting them off the needles, and they've been working out really well for me. So I'm on a good streak. I hope I can keep that going. The next item is a work in progress, and it is the Dear Duomo sweater by Sunghee Knits. And I'm making this in a really scrumptious, lovely yarn combination. We've got some fiber spades cumulus, in the color ethereal, which is a lovely lilac, lavender. And then we have um, Jing Fiber Cashmere Merino Sock. 
nylon base um, in the color mm, in the color floating, and together they make an absolutely lovely soft fabric. So this is a hand dyed yarn, and uh, I didn't alternate skeins at first, which uh, you will see me regret a little bit. So this is a bottom up sweater, and I'm actually at the point that I can show it to you in a way that looks like something because. Um, I've, I've finished the, the body. So you start off at the bottom and then you work in the round, then you split for the back and I worked the back panel first. Then you work the front and then you bind off the neck in the middle and then you work your front at the top. And then what I've done is I've temporarily joined the shoulders with some stitch markers just so I can hold it like that. Um, but what I'm going to do now, as the pattern calls, is I'm going to wet block this to the measurements and then it'll make it easier for me to seam the shoulders together and also to pick up the sleeve stitches afterwards. So I wanted to, to show you on the podcast today here like this because otherwise it would have been wet. Um, but I'm really excited to block this this afternoon. You've got some uh, one by one rib at the bottom, just a normal one by one. I did a tubular cast on, which was time consuming, but uh, worth it in my opinion. Then you have the body in the round and I'm going to show you the back. I was a bit disappointed at first in myself because I didn't alternate skeins and I thought there was quite a big difference in the distribution of the dark purple in the bottom, in the round section, and in the top flat section. So let me know if you can see that. And also I was rowing out a little. So this is the back. And again, I could really see it before, but I don't know if on camera it's gonna show. So uh, we'll see. I was a little sad about it. So I put it in the naughty corner uh, and then I worked on other things. Then when I picked it back up, I decided that that was the back anyway. So for the front, I would learn from my mistakes and I would fade in. Uh, I had finished my one, my first skein, I had three. So I decided for the front, I would fade in the other two and alternate these. Because that way, even if one of them was significantly more purple, the other one could maybe soften that a little bit compared to the bottom of the sweater. And then for the rowing out issue, I was already going down the needle size for the wrong side. So I was using 3.75 for my main needle and 3.5 for the wrong side for the back for the front i went down to a 3.25 for the wrong side which is very tight but i'm a very loose purler apparently even looser than i thought and i think that that helped i i definitely am not seeing as much rowing out for the front i am sadly still seeing a bit too much dark purple than i wish um, especially compared to the bottom of the sweater. But again, like I say, I, I don't actually know how this is going to look on camera. I don't know how it's going to look like when it's blocked, when it has the sleeves. So I'm not as disappointed in the pooling as I was with my Sonia sweater that I showed a few episodes ago. That one I could see from the start, there was a big brown spot in the shoulder. This one I'm not seeing massively, glaringly obvious color problems. So I think it'll be okay. I think it definitely didn't put me off the project altogether. I'm happy that I changed course from the back to the front and like solved the problems while I still had a chance. Um, and I guess it just is interesting to think that I really need to focus on my tension for, for knitting flat and, and focusing on making it the same as my in the round tension. For my first bottom-up construction, I'm having a lot of fun. I'm really enjoying the way that the pattern is written. It is quite bitty, like there's quite a lot of sections, which I think is making it addictive. If you're not into long patterns, then this might be a bit too detailed for you, or you might get a bit lost. But if you take it slowly, if you just read line by line, section by section, it all makes sense. I like that nothing has been left to chance. Everything is de described in, in, and, and then explained. There's a lot of choices for customization. For example, there's um, short row shoulder shaping or sloped bind off and grafting, which is obviously what I chose to do. It was my first time shaping with slope bind off and I really enjoyed doing that. It was addictive, it was fun, it looks nice. The instructions were super clear, they were written. Um, I didn't need to look up the technique in external places because the pattern was self-sufficient. Can you hear that? <laughs> um, and 
Yeah, I think a modification I did was that the, the pattern said to do a garter edge for what you're going to pick up afterwards. I prefer picking up from a straight edge, and it really doesn't matter anyway because that selvage stitch gets like hidden in the seam anyway. So I just did like knit on the right side, purl on the wrong side, whereas the pattern tells you to knit on both sides for that edge stitch. I just didn't. Um, yeah, uh, I think that's it. I'm actually, can I just say, for this Urania cardigan, Sari also had you do something different for the selvage. Well, so for, for, for this cardigan, Sari said to do a slip stitch for the sleeve opening and also a slip stitch for that entire edge before you pick up for the I cord that I did or before you pick up for the um, folded edge. I don't think that that was a good idea. I skipped it all together for the sleeve. I just did my like normal edge. I didn't slip any stitches and it was really easy to pick up for the sleeves afterwards. I did slip my stitch just before the cable every time. And that really made it difficult to pick up the right amount of stitches afterwards. If you've ever tried to pick up stitches from a slipped edge, you get half as many stitches. So you have to really get in there, find the hidden stitch to pick up in it. So I, I wouldn't have done that. That's my one criticism. I think it would throw off people as well if they didn't know how to pick up from a slip stitch edge. So yeah, I don't know why, why that was the case because a slip stitch looks nice when it's decorative as it's left out and that's what you see. But if it's something that you're going to pick up from afterwards, there really is no point in slipping stitches. So I don't know why that was. Anyway, back to this. Don't know if there's much else to say. Let me know if you can see the colors being weird. Um, I'm going to do the color in just one of the skeins. Then for the sleeves, what I was thinking of doing was just like starting them with one skein. And then when I reach the elbow, fade in the other skein. That way, if there's a color difference in the two skeins, at least it'll be symmetrical. So that's the plan for this. I think it'll be quite fast because the color I will do like in a day and then the sleeves I think are going to be very addictive and it's a drop shoulder so they're like a bit, they're not as long. Um, I'm, I'm super excited. I haven't tried this on yet, again because of the bottom up construction. Maybe I'll give it a cheeky little try on with that stitch marker solution. Uh, just to have an idea of how it looks on me. But yeah, next whip and last whip you've not seen before. Um, I cast it on a little after my last podcast. Someone very kindly gifted me the pattern for this. I'm taking part in Andrea Maori's March to May knit along. You can either do a sweater or a shawl. I actually talked about doing a sweater, um, but I'll talk about that later. And then I cast on a shawl. So this is the Birds of a Feather shawl by Andrea Maori. I um, talked about this in my um, two skin hand dyed project that um, I posted a, a month ago or something. So, uh, but I'm not following my own advice. I'm just doing it with one skin of hand dyed. It's hand dyed that I showed on the podcast as an acquisition some time ago. It was a, from Skin and the Stitch and it is the, the Iliad colorway based on the Iliad by Homer. Um, so this is what the skin looks like. I'll show you a photo of it as well. It's really lovely, it's like a white, off-white, greyish base with some greys, reds, a bit of um, black speckles. It's really, really lovely. I, I loved how it looked in the skin, in the cake and the fabric, which I will show you in a second. And then the second yarn I am using is actually some Surrey I had in stash. It's from Fiberspates. Once again, Cumulus and it is the color um, Early Grey. And this is actually yarn that I received from uh, my partner for the swap that Crea Bea did earlier or last year for Christmas time. Yeah, it was the advent swap. And um, yeah, so my partner gifted me two of these, which I thought was just enough, again, to go with the yardage I had for this. The Birds of a Feather shawl is normally one that uses maybe more than one skin of hand dyed, but a few people have offered modifications on Ravelry on how to maximize yardage of one skin of yarn and and how to make it less large so i am following this so here's what i've got so far so it doesn't look like too too much i'm having a lot of fun with it i'm, I'm really really enjoying it um this is actually the right side there's a central like spine in the middle 
which um yeah is is the right side um i'll sh i'll try and show some maybe photos or something because I, I don't know how how good you can see but you start at the bottom you've got that little point in your fingering weight yarn then you do this little garter of surrey more garter more garter then there's a lace section here which is a little thinner then you've got more garter more garter it is mostly garter but there's a bit of lace every now and then i'm actually at the point where i'm almost done increasing in this symmetrical way and after that things shift a little bit and your stitch count stays the same but your big your middle marker shifts as well so that the shawl starts to grow asymmetrically towards the right i think or the left doesn't matter so yeah i i guess it's hard to tell from photos especially the pattern photos from andra maori because they're so um you know stylized and staged that you don't actually see the shape of the shawl but if you see on some other Raveler's photos when they do flat lays, you can actually see the shape of the shawl and it is asymmetrical, which I wasn't sure I knew uh, at the start. I thought it was kind of that point that just grew all the way, but no, it's going to have a different shape. Um, I like the fact that the lace makes it ripple a little bit and have a wave. The garter is really squishy. I am loving this yarn combination. The Surrey is absolutely divine. It's like a cloud. Like the Surrey in the garter is so, so good. And then the fingering is really nice. It is a superwash merino nylon, I think, a sock yarn from Skin in the Stitch. So I'm uh, also thinking that this is going to grow a little bit with blocking. In fact, I am hoping so because, um, like I said, I'm, I'm not going to make the full length of the shawl because I'm playing yarn chicken. So I'm hoping to get more length by stretching it when I block it. Um, I'll maybe do a little close-up of it so you can see. So I'm really, really pleased with how those two colors look together. I had put a poll on my Instagram. I dug my stash for every single skein of hand-dyed that I thought would look nice with this skein. Uh, I put them all together and I, 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 I was wondering what would look good. And a lot of you suggested this one and it does look really good. It's a little busy for the hand dyed section, but then it's toned down by the neutrality of this Surrey. I saw some modifications, uh, I was tempted to follow them, but I thought maybe for my first version I would go mostly with what the pattern says, except from the, the final size. Uh, but maybe if I made a second version, I could follow those modifications. So, look, so there's a, a yarn over eyelet increase that you do on the sides. And you can't really see that it's that, like, holy, but um, someone suggested doing a knit front back instead of yarn overs. And then for the middle uh, ridge, for the middle spine, someone suggested doing a center double decrease instead of the decrease that's in the pattern. So I thought that that could be a nice thing to try on my next one. I really can see myself making a second one of these. Again, for a one skin or two skin hand dyed project, it really looks like an attractive project. It grows really fast. It's really addictive because at the start you don't have that many stitches. And even now when I'm almost at the most stitches I'll ever have, it's not that long a row. Like it's not like the Stephen West shawls, which are known for having an insane amount of stitches on the very last rows. It's not like that for this one. So it's still very fast. It is quite mindless except the the middle bit at the spine and then the yarn overs you have to do uh, so it's it's really enjoyable to do because it's not too hard but you still have to pay a bit of attention and you're never too far away from the next section which is really nice um it's nice because there's like stripes so it's addictive i really like the color i really like to see how it's working up um I'm excited to to see it start to change shape because right now it was getting a bit repetitive I'm worried about weaving in the ends. Uh, I was considering at first maybe carrying them up, but as you can see, there's quite a lot of distance to travel. So I decided to cut the yarn like the pattern calls for. I'm worried about weaving in the ends on the wrong side and then them poking out. Like I have a few issues with some scarves that I've, I've made, like my little Lolu shawl. The ends just keep on poking out, which is really annoying. And I don't know how to stop that because I don't want to cut them too close, otherwise they'll poke out on the other side anyway. 
Um, so I don't know. I, I hope maybe the Surrey ends are gonna really get lost in the stickiness of the, stir the Surrey, but the Superwash Merino, I don't know how to make it invisible. That's a problem for later, although maybe I'll, I'll do the ends actually before the end, so I, I'm, I stay motivated. I went down a needle size, and Mari calls for a 4mm needle for fingering weight, which I thought might be too gapy and too holy. So I went down to a 3.75, but in retrospect, I don't think that that was particularly necessary because, like I said, I, I'm losing width and length by, like, stopping earlier. So I'm hoping that it blocks out, and obviously if I had used the 4mm needle, then maybe it would have blocked out even to a bigger shawl um, size. But it's okay. Um, like I said, it really is just about experimenting. This is my first one, I might make another one. I just really didn't know what to expect with regards to the, the texture and the fabric, how that would form with such big needles for small yarn. But yeah, I think I could have been fine using the 4mm needle. So that's my Birds of a Feather by Andrea Maori, and I, I can't wait to have this finished. I'm curious to see how I'll be wearing that shawl, and I think the shape will be nice because it will be a bit more of a scarf rather than a shawl, so it'll be okay to just wrap around with a coat. And I think that's it for all my projects. So um, a couple of things I've not mentioned because there's just not been that much progress on. There's my lento and my crochet bag, just not really anything to update you on, so I'll show you that next time, possibly. Um, although, so I'll now move on to the future plan swatches and acquisition section. Some very exciting news, I was selected to be a sample knitter for Ching Fiber, which has featured in this episode, definitely. Um, I signed up some time ago to be a sample knitter, got like pre-selected, and then they put out a call recently asking if anybody was interested in and had the time to do a few of the samples for their upcoming collection. I, I hesitated, it was a really tight deadline, it is two weeks to make a garment, but I'm in a really good place with my knitting right now where um, I only have the Dare Duomo really as my garment on the needles and that's kind of it. So I actually did totally have room on the needles for something and I was up for the challenge. The compensation is really generous, you get some cash and you also get three balls of yarn and a gift card to their uh, shop. So super fair for the work that it is. I'm happy to do it. Uh, they sent me the yarn just yesterday and I swatched with it. I did ask whether I could show or talk about this and, and I haven't gotten a reply yet so I'm gonna keep this as vague as possible just in case. I'm gonna turn on the black and white filter and show you then the yarn. So here's a little sneak peek at it. Um, this is their merino base, superwash merino, and their mohair. And then this is the beginning of the project. So I'm not far, I really need to make sure I work on it every day because um, I obviously want to, to finish it on time for the deadline. I'll show you the swatch of the project and then maybe you can tell me if you recognize what the pattern is supposed to be. It's not that a popular a pattern and doesn't have a huge amount of finished items on Ravelry, but it has a distinctive look. So let me know if you know what this swatch is for. Leave your guess in the comments. But yeah, I'm super, super pleased with this new opportunity. Um, I'm excited for the challenge. It's really nice because both the yarn and the patterns are things that I wouldn't have chosen for myself or would wear myself. So it's so fun to be able to just knit for the process and not worry about whether this is gonna be wearable. For example, it has mohair. This is my first time working with both a hand-dyed mohair and a merino. Usually what I do is I have a plain um, merino and I use a hand dyed surrey or vice versa. Um, for example, this for example, it's a hand dyed merino with a normal surrey and yeah, it's just, it feels very luxurious to actually knit with both the hand dyed mohair and, and, and uh, merino. It's, it's really really fun so far and I can't wait to show you and tell you more about this. So I thought it could be fun for a little uh, guessing game. I'll put a photo here of the um, the yarn again with the black and white filter and I wanted you to maybe guess what the colors were and then whoever when uh, uh, whoever correctly guesses I'll gift you uh, any pattern from the Crea Bea if you wish to 
to, to receive any of them. So uh, the way that I would describe these colors is my first thought when I saw it was that it was like a tropical cocktail that you'd get on holiday or some of those um, sour candy strips. So yeah, sour candy, summer cocktail. There's about, I would say, four main colors and I'll be really flexible depending on what you say. If you get three out of the four um, or you get the general kind of like main colors, then yeah, you'll be entered to win. So what colors uh, are present in this beautiful skein? And uh, I'll message you then by the end of the week. So next Monday, I'll, I'll pick a winner from the correct guesses and you can tell me what pattern you want from Rebecca. So I hope that, that you enjoy that. Just thought it'd be a fun way uh, for people to, to guess colors based on this like black and white filter and my description of it. Um, and also, yeah, just a different way to, to give out that free pattern from Rebecca since I have no, no need for it. But I'm super excited. Like I say, I, I can't stop thinking about this. I'm, I'm really glad that I took that opportunity. I think it's a good way for me to solve my problem of knitting too much than I know what to do with. Uh, if I do gift knits or sample knits, it'll be a good way for me to keep knitting without the pressure of keeping everything that I make. So I'm super interested in doing more sample knits in the future. If you yourself are a brand or a yarn dyer who watches my podcast and you want me to make a sample knit for you, please get in touch with me. I'd be more than happy to discuss that. Um, because of that, I'm going to maybe put on hold a lot of other projects. So like I said, I was maybe wanting to make the Andra Maori uh, pink velvet. I skinned up the yarn. This was going to be my main color and this was going to be the fluff. And I made a swatch with, uh, it's a color work sweater, but I just made the swatch in the main yarn. So here it is. I'll put a photo on screen as well. But this is, oh yeah, it's kind of see-through. It's actually also from Ching Fiber. This is their Yak Singles. So the stitches are looking very interesting because it is single ply. I don't think I've ever knitted with single ply before. Definitely not a garment. And I'm finding it very interesting and a little worried about the durability of this and the friction. Uh, for the color work, I was also hesitating between holding this melted surrey single or double. It is definitely... Um, thicker than mohair for example so i think single would be completely fine for color work and i was wondering if i was holding this double would it be too um too thick and distracting and maybe it would completely obscure the main color but i think i just have enough yardage to hold this double and i was wondering if it would be nice and efficient to maximize the usage of the skin but it's not a problem that i have to solve for a while because i'm not going to cast this on while i'm doing my other um sample knit so yeah, I just wanted to show you the little swatch and tell you that I'm I'm still hesitating to cast this on and participate in the cal from Andra Maori because I don't think I'll finish this by the end of May unless that's all I focused on after my sample knit. And then the last thing I wanted to show you, which is kind of an acquisition, but like I said in my latest knit and chat, I'm kind of wanting to move away from acquisitions just for the sake of acquisitions. And instead I'd like to make them more in context and maybe show you a swatch or or tell you exactly what it's going to be for and, and I don't know, make them a bit more than just I bought this. So um, I, if you don't know, I'm planning to make a big magnum opus project, which is going to be the Yale Cardigan by Mary Wallen. And this was part of like my charity live stream and it was like the challenge to do this if we donated enough money, which like you guys did. Um, I'm actually hosting a magnum opus knit along on Discord and on Instagram. It's mostly on Discord, but you can use the hashtag on Instagram. And anything that you consider to be your magnum opus or your Mount Everest or your biggest project ever, and you're too scared of starting it maybe, or you don't know if you have the skills, well, now is the time to do it and cast it on. You don't have to finish it, or it could also be an existing project. Just pick it back up. So my one is going to be the yellow card again, and um, I've been slowly accumulating the colors that I need uh, on Wool Warehouse when there was a sale, on Great British Yarns when there was a sale. So I finally got all my yarns except one, but I, I couldn't find it in a lot of the stores, so I'm just going to have to suck it up and pay for shipping for just one ball, which I hate doing, but that's what we have to do. 
Um, so I have all the colors except one and I wanted to show you what they all look like together. So I'll show you a little b-roll here. Um, I definitely was inspired by the palette from A Hundred Acre Wool, Bella. She made this a few years ago now and I really, really love her version. She went completely off book and created her own spring palette for this beautiful cardigan and I, I, I love her choices. I'm so grateful that she wrote them all down. So I just went and bought all of the same yarns that she used and I will be following her uh, color palettes, which I'm really happy to be doing. Don't need to reinvent the wheel and, and make up my own color palette. It's it's really hard to do. So so maybe I'll swatch by the next podcast or maybe I'll just get started already. It's bottom up. So you start off at the color work band at the bottom of the cardigan, which in itself will, it won't really be a swatch because it'll be quite huge, but you're going to use most of your colors at the bottom of the cardigan. And then the two shades of gray are for the main body, which you do afterwards. So if you want to follow me along on this journey, I'm, I'm really excited about it. I'm really daunted by it, but I'm glad to have this motivation to cast it on this year. And uh, I'm really happy to have finally gotten all the yarns for it at a reasonable price, always trying to be thrifty. And I hope that you're as excited as I am about it. And I'm really in my color work era. Love Jameson's of Shetland Wool. Love the way that it blocks. <laughs> so, so yeah, I think this is going to be such a good piece to have. I think ever, ever since making more of my color work accessories, I've just found a, an even bigger appreciation for this wool. So I think that this is coming just at the right time. I think that's it for all the knitting. Don't know how long this has been. I feel like I was a little bit more rambly than usual today. So I hope that um, you enjoyed watching this episode. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of a life update. Like I said, I was off for the last week, so it's been really good. I feel so relaxed and rested. I've had a lot of lions in the morning. We've been on um, a few dates in Edinburgh. We went to see Hamilton, which was fantastic. We also went on a little Bob Ross painting date. I shared a photo on my Instagram, but it was a little class held in a bar. Um, me and my boyfriend went and it was a group of maybe 20 people. And we all had like the paints on the table and the uh, uh, educator just kind of demonstrated what she was doing. And we had two hours to do a painting. So this is what mine turned out to be like and I'm really proud of it. Um, I'm like really proud of some elements, some elements I'm less happy with. Paint is really not my medium of choice. I, I find it really hard, like it's it's such a commitment because it's harder to um, blend together but uh, I, I'm really really happy that I've made this. We only had like the four colors on our palettes and the fact that we only had the two hours to do was really nice because you just didn't have time to be too perfectionist about it. You just had to move on and do the other part. You had to wait for the base to dry and then do a little bit of the details afterwards. And it was a mad rush at the end. I'm really proud of this. And it was really nice to be doing a different hobby than knitting because I was so free of all the pressures that I didn't even realize really were there with the knitting about sharing on social media or comparing myself with other people or wondering if this would be content or having to 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 be really good at it like it was just just doing a hobby for the sake of doing a hobby and i know i'm sharing this now on social media and it's content but it's just like a little 30 second bit where i'm telling you that I went for a painting class and i really enjoyed it so much and it made me want to maybe delve a bit more into my other hobbies like I used to do color pencils a lot and I really enjoy that and I have paints at home as well so I told Ross we could just do a little Bob Ross date at home and do another painting so maybe we'll do that and I just felt so refreshed and rejuvenated and I feel like my love of crafting got revived and my creative juices are flowing due to painting it just made me feel more creative in general so that's been that's been it's been a really good week for me. The knitting has been really good as well. I feel like the the thing that's been a bit abandoned this week is just like social media and content creation. I've enjoyed doing the podcast and I'm happy to do them and I'm happy with the quality of them. I, I'm I'm proud to be putting that out there. But I've had a lot of grand ideas of other videos. I've been wanting to make a lot of different videos. But I just either am not in the mood or I'm worried I'm not going to be able to carry it out the way that I, I have it in my head. I just don't want things to, to not turn out how I want them to be. 
So, so I've, I've not really been in the mood to, to make other videos, which is completely fine, and the podcast is, is great to do. Um, so, I don't know, I feel like it's kind of a disconnect between, like, the more I'm having fun with the knitting, maybe the less I want to make videos about it, and then vice versa, maybe if, if I um, don't have as much inspiration around knitting, then I have more time to focus on the video content creation. Don't know, if you have a podcast, do you feel like that? So in that vein, I don't think there's going to be any spring knitting plans video because I'm focused on finishing all my winter plans anyway. Um, I'm going to be doing the sample knit, which is going to take a big chunk of my time for March. And then for April, I just don't want to commit to making things and then feeling weird if I don't make them. I'm not feeling any particular inspiration around spring anyway, so I don't think that it would be genuine for me to talk about spring inspiration where I, I don't actually have any inspiration right now. So yeah, I don't think I'm going to be making that video, but I'll just be following on the plans that I've already talked at length in the past about what I'm wanting to make, either when I was talking about my plans for the year or my magnum opus project or um, when I was bringing up acquisitions and saying what they were going to be. I'm just basically going to follow through on that. So a lot of the things you're going to see in the future I've probably talked about before already at some point or another. And then lastly, on Saturday, I'm going to the Wool Producer Showcase in March, uh, in Perth. Um, so if you see me there, come and say hi. I'd love to chat to you. I'm super excited to go to this first festival of the year. I don't really have many plans for it or anything that I'm looking for. So I don't know if I'm going to be making a lot of acquisitions. I think maybe like a project bag or some buttons or something that's like non-yarn related, uh, I could see myself bringing back. But in terms of yarns, I already have still a few skeins of those uh, Scottish wools. So I'm probably going to prioritize using these as opposed to adding more to the stash. We'll see what I say in a couple of weeks. But yeah, I'm really curious to see what the next podcast is, is going to be like because if I'm doing my sample net for the next two weeks, I probably won't have that much to talk about. Oh, and lastly, before I go, one more update is the winter set cal that I'm hosting with Ode from Bubbles and Berries is running until the 20th of March. So two more days to get your photos up on Instagram, either at the winter set cal hashtag or winter set fo for your finished sets. We'll be drawing winners from both of the hashtags. Ode is gifting some of her stitch markers. I'll be gifting a pattern of your choice on Ravelry. So it's been amazing seeing all of your creations, all of your sets. You guys take amazing photos. I love them. It's been super inspiring to see what people choose to uh, knit as part of a set, even though they weren't marketed as such, but people have been combining patterns from different designers. It's been really, really inspiring. And um, accessories are just so fun to knit all year round anyway. So if you haven't already, go check the hashtag and maybe favorite some of the projects to, to pick from later on if you want to make accessories in the future. So yeah, thank you so much for participating, you guys. We'll announce the winners probably on our Instagrams, maybe as well on our podcast, depending on if the winners like get in touch or not. Um, but yeah, one huge thank you to everyone who participated. It's been super fun hosting this knit along. And yeah, the last knit along that I'm hosting then is the Magnum Opus Cal. So definitely join the Discord if you haven't already um, or check uh, other people's photos if you don't intend to participate yourself. It's just always nice to be part of the community. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. It's been great talking to you all about the updates and showing off the photos of my latest makes. Hope you're doing well wherever you are. Happy knitting and see you all later. Bye.